Welcome to Open Your Reality, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chad, and today I have a guest that is a favorite of many people that watch the show. His name is Howdy Mikowski. Welcome back to the show, Howdy. Hey, Chad. Good to be back. Um, yeah, it's it's been a few months, I guess, maybe three months since I've been here, four months, something like that. So good to see you again. Yes, it has. We've done a couple of interviews in the past, but we actually just did one for my buddy's podcast, We Are One. And that was um, last week, was it, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. Did he post it yet or I haven't seen it up anywhere yet? Uh, I don't know, but I've posted a few clips of our talk on my channel. So <laughs> Yeah, I saw that, but I haven't seen the full one yet. Mm -hmm. by the way, yeah by the way for people watching my microphone broke so i'm talking into my webcam so if i sound a little different that's why hopefully it, you can bear with it for this video uh so that's the way how life works in the simulation howdy it's not always perfect mm -hmm. no. so you uh you wrote this book called exit the cave it's been about a year and a half now since the book has been published uh being that you were the author of it and, and it had some, some interesting concepts in there, some different concepts, now that you've reflected back on it, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, yeah, it's been interesting because over the last couple of weeks, I've had time to kind of really think about, you know, what's the what was the underlying question in the book? And, of course, normally people would be thinking, well, it's, it's about uh, soul traps or it's about reincarnation or it's about memory wipes or cathars. Or... And I realized actually what it is, at its core, it's asking people a question. And that one question it's asking people is, we all come out, we all sort of come into this world with a foundational belief that this reality was created by a loving God who cares about us and created this world, in a sense, for us. And I guess my book at its core is actually getting to that question and, and, and sort of saying, before you could go any further than that, it's to say, how did I come to that belief? Where did that belief originate and why do I believe it? Not not again to say what someone should or shouldn't believe. Of course, as you know, I, I don't agree with that anymore. Obviously, I did a long time ago because it was like you were supposed to. But it's I think that's that's the main question of the book, because if if somebody won't at least examine that question in themselves to kind of say, OK, where does this idea come from? Why do I why do I believe it? What is my experience in the world that you might say proves proves or disproves it? then all the rest of the book doesn't really matter. It's just information that's just flowing along. But if someone's going to at least ask that question and say, okay, that's interesting. I'm wondering where that, because um, that, that's a foundational belief came from, then all of these other topics, whether it's simulation reality, is it a soul trap? Are there beings here to help us or hurt us? Or it, it all It's like it all flows from there, no matter where you want to go. But I realize that's the foundation question that my book is asking people to contemplate. Yeah, um, and it, it's a good book. It's well written. Um, so if, if you haven't seen it, I suggest you see it. Yeah, it's a good book. And the thing is, how do you like? How long ago did you start believing that we might be living in a soul trap? Well, I, I probably started touching on it when I first began this stuff. For me 25 to 30 years ago when i because i because i was coming out of such a dark period right with all the things that trauma that happened to me death of the girlfriend the depression all that kind of stuff and as i looked around me there wasn't a lot of people that i saw were really happy so let's just say i i, I knew already in the 19 mid 1990s something was wrong with this place i didn't know what it was but it it, it didn't match the story I was given of how this place was supposed to run. There were a few isolated cases of like a few people that I knew were, they're actually doing okay. And they're quite, they're, they're seemingly okay. But I knew if I checked in with them in 10 years, it might not be the same anymore. You know, it's just they're there now, but that doesn't mean they're going to be there in five or 10 years. So I, I already had it then. When I first dug into the ancient Egyptian stuff in the ancient world, and I started reading ancient texts, be it the Egyptian funerary texts, uh, things like the Chilambalam and the and the Popovol of the Maya and the Indian texts, and it, they, all of, there was this always this underlying um, 
battle of duality that's being presented in it all. There's always this, the, the, this sort of clash that's going on underneath all of these things. So something was already telling me it, it, it's not, it, it can't be the loving place we've been told it is because all of these cultures all over the world wouldn't be telling us something else. But I didn't, I didn't go any deeper than that. I mean, I saw that there were problems in this place. I saw that it was quite insane, but I still had the belief I could fix it. You know, I was still holding that idea that like, yeah, God, something wrong here and he needs me to fix it. And in one way or another, I sort of tried that for 10 years off and on. And maybe about seven or eight years ago is when I hit the point where I realized, I think the place is unfixable. Okay, let's ask why. And it still took me another five or six years. I had to go through that expositions book that I wrote to sort of uh, derail history and the possibility of the of the reality of history. And then I was finally ready to be able to accept, okay, I think the thesis I have is correct about how I see the world. But like I say to you, Chad, and everybody out there, always, it's a thesis. You know, I don't know for sure. Nobody can say they know for sure. All, we're, all people can do is bring a little bit of truth the way they see it and the way they've come to look at it and share it and say, you know, take this piece of truth with your piece of truth and this other person's piece of truth. And if you put them all together, you might actually get the story here. But I know, I know for a fact tomorrow I could see something completely different, but it's been 30 years almost to get to where I am now to see the world with this very unrosy kind of glasses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. Um, I, you know, I have this debate in my mind all the time, and I say, is it really a soul trap or isn't it a soul trap? And sometimes I think to myself, well, if what they tell us about the spirit world is true, that it's a place where we don't really have a body like we do here, we're more like ener energy uh, in the spirit world, we don't need to pay rent, we don't need money, uh, we, we can travel instantaneously go anywhere do anything we have everything we want it's a very um it's a very hunky-dory experience there there's nothing that we really lack for and the reason that we come into a physical world like earth we choose to reincarnate supposedly choose is because frankly the spirit world could be boring after a while there's no challenge there it's maybe a place we go to rest after a world like earth so do you think that there's a possibility that maybe Earth is the way it is because it's supposed to be this way? It's supposed to be challenging and maybe not the most fun of experiences sometimes because the spirit world is our maybe our natural home and that's where everything is, is uh, copacetic. Everything's great there. And so we come here and then we have these very, you know, some seemingly turbulent lives, but it's all temporary. And then we go back home and we can stay home if we want. But a lot of us choose to be here. I mean, have you thought about that whole track of argument? Of course. Okay. Went through all, like I say, you know, been 30 years of this. And uh, um, I come to see it now that the spirit world isn't as lovely and nice as it's like to be presented. Again, I sort of I sort of present a, a really good examples with near-death experiences where I see the standard near-death experience of the white light and Jesus and grandma and feelings of love is like going to the waiting room of the dentist, but you haven't really seen the dentist. It's like you've gone to the dentist and someone comes, or you've gone to the waiting room and someone says, it's okay, you can go home now. Oh, that's it? Wow, fantastic. And, and I think there's these deeper and deeper places that are kind of how the astral realm really, we're talking, because we're kind of talking about the astral realm really. Now there are places beyond the astral realm that are quite heavenly actually. Um, like like nirvana is a place in the but it's tricky because it's still in the matrix so it's still not true totality it's still not true completeness so that would be your so that would be your idea of boredom now I, i've heard some um near-death or i guess you call them pre-birth experiences of people who claim they were in this heavenly place that they were in nirvana and it said exactly what you said it's it was boring. It was like, it's the most beautiful piece of music being played, but it's being played over and over and over again. I got to get out of here. So you can almost, if you, if you twitch your mindset slightly, you could see that as a form of torture too. Mm -hmm. That torture is not just constant pain. There's a great Twilight Zone episode. I can't remember what the name of it is, but 
somebody doesn't know he's dead he think or he's dead he thinks he's in heaven and they put him in he's an old gambler and they put him in las vegas and he wins he wins every single time every girl will do anything he wants and finally he just says please let me lose you know i've got to have the feeling of losing again you know and finally just okay just get me out of heaven i, I need to get to hell and finally this guy who's been talking says where do you think you've been all this time so it's it's really strange I see now how the how the manipulation tactics could be could be going here. So in one sense I don't disagree with what you just said at all. I think and I've seen it myself. The question is could that also be part of a very bizarre massive matrix system that we're in that it's not just nasty stuff that's part of the trap. There's all sorts of things that seem really nice at the beginning but are, you know, if you're in prison and somebody gives you an extra hour a day of uh, outdoor um, outdoor time, you would think that's great, but you're still in prison. That's true. Uh, the yard time is probably the most coveted time that you're you spend in a prison because it's the only time you go out. But I know what you mean because uh, yeah. if if something is is great all the time, you get bored with it. Um, yeah. You need the ups and downs. Maybe that inherently the problem is just us consciousness. Just it's built. Have you ever thought of what consciousness it what consciousness is and why it is? Why were we built with this feeling of, of being bored? Well, we've got I guess there's a couple of questions to sort of first try to define even what that is, because um, when I had my death experience. Uh, again, I feel very lucky to have had all of these hybrid of experiences over the 30 years because it, it 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 sort of makes things tangible for me. So when I was in that experience, I'd been in a place before where I could witness thought. So, okay, so I, I was able to be in a place where I could be like you call it awareness. So I'm awareness and I could see thought. So I knew in these sort of meditative moments, I couldn't be thought because... I was seeing it, so I and the thought couldn't be the same thing. But when I went through the death experience, it became also so strange that I was now in a place where I could see the awareness, seeing the thought. So this thing that I had thought myself to be, this awareness, I realized, oh, I'm not that either. I'm something else even beyond that. So we also have this weird question to come up of like, if we say consciousness, to mean like the ultimate I guess, observer or ultimate totality of whatever we are, how far back do we have to go to actually be in that state? And there's so many stopping points on the way, it's really easy to think, I'm here, I've, I've landed, I'm at this total consciousness, not even realizing, yeah, there might be one more step even before we're even truly at our consciousness. So it's, it's, it, you know, I'm trying not to, I don't want to confuse everything for people and, and sound like, guru-like or something but unfortunately that's the case we are so we have been so we've been given so little information directly about what our reality is and where we are or why we're here i mean how many thousands of years that everyone's still asking what's the meaning of life and no one really knows you'd think by now we'd have figured it out it's it's a complex thing we've put ourselves into here i mean it seems to me like there are a lot of things we haven't figured out about this reality all the time. I have my viewers debate whether we live on a, a globe or a flat earth. Uh, there's so many sides to the coin uh, and on almost every conspiracy theory. It's yeah. it's kind of yeah. difficult sometimes. I, I mean, that, that could be an inherent part of the program as well to never make you never make you see exactly what it is. It's, there's always a dichotomy. What are your thoughts? Because that yeah, that, that keeps the duality going, right? If, if, um, it, if that, that, to me, it's always been the third case. So if someone says, do you think the earth is flat or do you think the earth is uh, round? I would say yes. <laughs> Why can't they be both? Because then the answer is something in the middle that's something completely different. Both sides could have possibly something truthful um, that could be put together that could show the real thing. But as long as the two sides want to fight each other, and say my side is the only side that's right it would be like you know um a buddhist and a christian battling each other who's right as mm -hmm. opposed to just a wait a minute maybe there's parts of it are both right let's figure out how we're both right and then we might find out a bigger truth than we ever thought we had so i i think of everything in that way it's like can you combine the two opposites to see if you find a third something that's 
greater than both of them. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, one thing that confuses me as well is that there are a lot of people, I've seen it on YouTube, that talk about the, their near-death experience. And they mm -hmm. went to hell. And they talk about the most absolutely horrible experiences. And then you have people talking about the love and light. And I'm just wondering, how do you have such two contrasting views? And these people who are talking about going to hell, um, they're not hardened criminals. I mean, they're just regular people. So where, where, how, does, how does that work out? Again, this is okay. This is just again my opinion on it, right? For everybody, but my sense is the the ones that were hell like are a little more complete experience. They went to the dentist. They actually got the teeth drilling that comes as part of the whole death experience. And if you were the dentist and you wanted to keep people coming back to you, you'd want to have a lot of people just making it to the waiting room or you know just getting their teeth cleaned and going back. Because if everybody came to see you was just talking about, he butchered me. Oh my God, I, my, my jaw was sore for the next five weeks. He's not going to get any more people going. So I, as weird as this sounds, I get a sense that the experience people are having, the love and light experience is in one sense truthful. And, it, and I, I'm certainly not saying anybody's making the, the experience up. I think it's a very valid, honest sharing and I'm glad I'm, I'm grateful that they share it actually because we we need to see how prevalent it is the question then has to be asked is that the real experience or could that be like yeah this little piece of propaganda that they want to make sure that when we get there we think that's the greatest thing to do I don't even want to question it that's where I'm going and I guess part of exit the cave and part of all these conversations is just to get people to sort of say well, we're not really sure what the best move is after we die, actually. We have all this potential information. I think the best thing to do is can we just s be still for a while and allow ourselves to get a lay of the land, allow ourselves to look around a bit, and then make the decision that we feel is right for us and don't feel pushed or rushed or going into anything. Even if it seems beautiful on the surface, maybe it's not so beautiful once you cross the doorway, you might say. So... I think it's good to, I, I think of looking at the near-death experiences and showing what's possible out there should be a really good way of getting us to say, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna keep my awareness, I'm going to practice to keep my awareness available after I die so that I can be the one that chooses at least what happens uh, after that point. That's what I feel is, is the greatest suggestion I can make to anyone. Right. And you revealed in our last conversation, which was last week, um, kind of spoiler alert, but most of us are not heading to a pleasant experience after our death. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, without going in too deeply, because I guess this this is going this is where I'm working on with the next book. But it yeah, it seems like there are, if I would classify it now from the work I've gone into, there are like stages of the after death experience, and different stages, different things happen. And um, you might say all the energy that we've ever had in our life and every experience we ever had has to be eaten by something, you might say. It has to be, we can call it, you can call it return to the source, however you want to call it. But a lot of that is not going to be fun and it's not going to be pleasant. And so I'm beginning to see the stages of this whole process. And I'm also starting to feel like that's the reason there's an inherent fear we have of dying. It's actually not the way it's always, I've always been sort of come to believe that it's because it's the ego that's so afraid to die. That's what we hear in the spiritual tech. It's really the ego that's afraid to die. It's afraid of it ending its existence. It's afraid of, you know, it's, it's your story not being important anymore. But that might, there might be some truth to that. But there's the other side of it. There might be something subconscious in us that remembers our last death the whole part of the experience before we got reincarnated in here and something in us knows, I don't want to really go through that again. So I'm going to try to push that away as long as possible. So I'm kind of looking, I found some sources, uh, some modern, some ancient that seem to suggest that, but they are so rare and they are so like, they're, they're places that you would never think to look 
that's offering this possible idea. So I'm just throwing it out there that things might be different than the way we are normally presented they might be. Uh, based on your research, do you have any idea of how many lives the average person has lived? Oh, good question. Um, I would have no idea because first of all, it's like how many lives have you and I had as Chad and Howdy? Right there, there's the first question we'd even have to sort of figure out is because I know I've I've had several, I've seen several alternate lives. I don't know whether they're parallel lives, like I said, and they're and they're equally going on, or if it's been some sort of time loop and I just keep living the same thing over and over again. So I know I've got 10, 20 at least of this one. Then it's how many more do we go back in time? Um it's a it's an interesting question because um and i think it would help if we have somebody because there, there's a few people who say they have access to a lot of their previous lives and the more lives that somebody would share with us that were really insignificant you know they were a shoemaker in a small town in germany and they made shoes another one oh yeah i i just farmed with my wife and my kids uh somewhere in the uh you know Ethiopian desert and we just lived 20 years there and I died like ones that have like no significance whatsoever that might give us an idea of if somebody has that memory how many we have um I if I would guess though if I would guess we might not have that many because my feeling is if we've had let's say each life you do live you live it say 10,000 times okay. Well, you don't need too many lives going back to sort of cover a whole lot of experiences and a whole lot of energies and a whole so maybe maybe we might be five or ten lives total going backwards in time but we could be living those ten thousand times a piece in, in parallel or looped realities so if they were in parallel or looped realities hmm. then we we consciously wouldn't remember them right we wouldn't we would feel like this is always the first time or unless we had deja vu uh, yeah, kind of. Or, however, there's there's like there's one story I tell so often. There's a there was a woman I a woman now she's a girl in high school, and uh, no chance we would ever date. But we we became like dance partners in the in the in school gym class, and our dancing was just beyond phenomenal. Like there was no way the two I can't dance like that now. It was like something to do with dancing with her, and it was the same thing. Her dancing with me. It wasn't until years later I'd had a I'd had a dreaming experience and I realized, oh geez, in another life we married. And we just this is that was just a part of our life in that other existence. And it made complete sense of the kind of connection we had, even though there was so many things that were very, very smooth for the two of us in this life, I realized it was pieced together in that life. So it, it, it for me it's kind of says there i call it bleed some of these lives bleed into the others or they come through so sometimes we can be we become want to become friends with somebody who's that guy right there I, I know i need to be this guy's friend but i don't know i just know i need to go talk to him and say hi and if we tracked it we probably see in an alternate life you and him probably were really good friends and you spent a tremendous amount of time together or you were soldiers in the army and one he saved your life or something and you want to you know who knows but it's it's interesting to see that most of the time we don't remember other than i think there are certain draws or certain feelings or certain uh, things that happen that pull us toward uh, certain people that we had certain connections with and be it's also the opposite there'd be certain people that were instantly we instantly dislike them you know mm -hmm. i i don't like this guy and well it's nothing bad about this guy i mean he's not evil or anything he's not like you know no, yeah but i don't like him why because maybe 50 lives ago you and him really didn't like each other are you familiar with the work of anthony peak i know some of it I, I mean i've looked into a little bit of it but i haven't studied it in like absolute detail um i guess you've probably if you looked into it more deeply probably than me uh, i've had anthony peak on my show twice what? and and uh i have one of his books but his whole take on, on reincarnation um, is that kind of like what you said, we, we get one life, he believes we get one life, but we live it over and over and over until we somehow get it perfect, just kind of like Groundhog's Day. And then I think we're out, but I, I, I don't disagree. I, excuse me, I don't agree with that. 
but I right. find it to be incredibly interesting. Uh, and I think that Sorry, I'm just looking, keep talking. I'm just looking for a book. Yeah. And I think that of all the people I've had on the show, um, among you and maybe a couple others, I think Anthony Peake was one of the most interesting, well-spoken guests, especially mm. when you have a British, when you have a British accent, you automatically go up a level. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, uh, have you seen the movie edge of tomorrow with Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt? It's about, it's a sci-fi version of, um, of uh, the movie I just mentioned, Groundhog's Day. No, I haven't seen it. But now that you've mentioned it, I'll look into it. Have you read the, the novel Replay by Ken Grimwood? No, no. So that's, that's, that's the book that Groundhog Day was based on, except in the book, he's not reliving the same day. He's reliving the same life. And what's interesting is every life, it, it's so different from Groundhog Day because in, in the, in replay, the main character is trying to better his life each time, trying to, you know, trying to improve it, trying to, and every time it kind of just ends up exactly kind of how the last life was. Mm -hmm. Like nothing kind of really gets overly uh, changed. Nothing gets terribly worse, you might say. I mean, lots is different, but the overall, has he really learned anymore? No. And so it's such an interesting read for that because it's the total opposite of what you would think a writer would write on this subject about. So it, it's one I would also recommend if you like this subject of repeating lives, it, it, yeah. because it's so different than what you would expect a writer would suggest about this topic. One more time, can you say the title and the author for the audience? Yep, it's called Replay. And the author is Ken Grimwood. I think it's from 1986. Mm. Yeah, and I think, I'm trying to think of the year that Groundhog's Day came out. Maybe it was 89. 1991. Something. 91, okay. Yeah. I have to say that when you look at movies across the board in Hollywood, that is, that is a movie that had, at that time, it was very a very original script. I don't think I've seen other video, uh, other movies like it. And that's why I like Edge of Tomorrow. First off, I'm a I'm a Tom Cruise fan. Yes. I, I think Emily Blunt did a great job in the video, and it's like I said, it's a sci-fi version. So you might want to check that out. And it's what what year was that one from? Just curiously, 2004, I believe 2014. Okay, so that means because there's uh, Emily Blunt was also in um, Adjustment Bureau, and that was 2013. So it's interesting also sometimes that movies that have knowledge or wisdom in them have repeating actors for some reason in the same movies almost like it's like an extra focus like hey look at this movie you know we're telling you something and we're using a similar actor or actress yeah and the year before tom cruise did a movie called oblivion with morgan freeman oh, yeah. that was 2013 right. and that was a yeah. little bit of a truth drop yeah. movie as well yeah so um because that's interesting that we're now we're talking about movies like i say groundhog day for the time I, I see sort of a few different eras. We had the early 60s, where all of a sudden you had, tw you had Twilight Zone, Outer Limits. You had a number of these shows all discussing reality in their own kind of way with a very sort of often extraterrestrial UFO edge to it. But still, they, they went through a ton of different ideas there. Then you had Star Trek, a number of different things. That were, then we kind of had nothing for a while. Then you have Groundhog Day pops up, a few things pop up, and then all of a sudden, 98 or 99, right? Here comes Dark City. Here comes The Matrix. Here comes The Truman Show. Here comes Dar Donnie Darko. Within four or five years, a whole bunch comes out. Then it slowed down again. And then just like I say, around that time, just after 2012, a whole other series of movies come out that are all written. And then it's kind of gone down again. And we haven't had the new influx of you know a couple of tv shows recently like westworld maybe severance maybe a few uh there's an 1899 so there's been a few television series lately but we've we have it seems like we have this a wave of of movie knowledge that it comes in for a while and then it's like it just goes away then we have some more movies that come in and it goes away again it's very unique to watch the the rise and fall of this information as it's presented to us yeah it is it really is um well, obviously, the, the Matrix movie that came out in 1999 talks a lot about artificial intelligence. Mm. Where does artificial intelligence play into your theories? In my theory, it would say that the entire of Plato's cave, so the whole Matrix, is artificial intelligence. That the mm. demiurge, 
that the demiurge might be called the initial programmer and that everything else here in some way or another is is controlled by some form of AI, including us. Uh, a great television program, if someone is, I don't know if I've mentioned it with you before, but if you I haven't, it's, it's the 1968 BBC half hour uh, series called Newsbenders. I'll say again, Newsbenders, it was BBC, you can see it on YouTube, I have a video on it myself. It explained everything about our reality from how the things are planned years in advance who's doing the planning and that every decision every government in the world makes is all coming from a giant computer stored somewhere in downtown london 1968 it's telling us that every decision is being made by a computer and i think what we're seeing now within our real this reality of ai and and how much they're letting us see of how much it controls if we just think multiply that by a hundred or a thousand that's how much of the whole real matrix is controlled by ai and even even within the system even within our world itself our, our reality i don't think people realize that like in most cases your job's going to be redundant like ai is going to be doing it really really soon and uh, people don't get it i know how do you um I was just looking into this myself because every time I think about maybe starting a business or doing something, there's an AI yeah. app that comes out that does it, that does everything and more better than anything a human can do. Right. And I yeah. was like, like, the, like, like our, oh, there you go. That's, that's life happening. Chad's super right. busy. <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, I'm doing a podcast. Please call me back in about 45 minutes. All right, sorry. That's my business partner from Asia, and uh, yeah. I should have I should have turned the phone. Nobody ever really calls me except him, and of course, he always calls like every, almost every interview I do. Yeah. All right. But that, yeah, that, so I mean, like an architect, is an architect really going to be needed when AI is going to be able to design to like perfection how a building should be done? Right. Like a lot of case, writers, like even now, it's it's pretty scary what some of these AIs can do. Uh, for anything writing writing quality, wow. Well, think think about this, Howdy. AI has gotten to be so good that it could clone um, it could clone a, a face and make it look just like a face, just like a face is talking. You can clone the voice. You can change the background. Um, it, the AI is a writer too, so it can create content, endless content, and it can keep doing this. There's you literally there could be somebody sitting anywhere in the world at their computer generating a hundred videos per day just cranking them out one after another and they're all ai and then you have let's say you have thousands a million of these people or more and they're posting these videos up on social media like youtube the amount of videos that are going on youtube just keeps increasing uh the quality is probably dropping in, in one sense um eventually there's going to be so many videos that it's just going to over flood the whole circuitry. I don't know if Google servers are going to be able to handle it. And furthermore, uh, most of these videos are not going to be really seen that much. I mean, it could affect advertising with monetization. I just see it being a huge mess all around. And I think uh, it's kind of like giving a, a toy to a, a child, a very, a very uh, sophisticated toy. It's just going to end up wrong. And like you said, I don't know how this whole simulation is going to go. I, did you say that you think that's the end of the simulation is kind of near? Ray Kurzweil wrote the book, right? He wrote a book talking about the singularity, but I think it was in 2046 or 2049. But this whole AI it started really exploding, um, I would guess, earlier this year, late last year, all these new chat GPT and all these new AI tools, they keep coming out. And it's only going to escalate. Uh, where do you see the end of this simulation? How does AI play into it? And what are your thoughts? Yeah, again, I get the sense it's, it's very much that hermetic idea, right? As above, so below, uh, microcosm, macrocosm, that we're seeing more and more within this thing. As it's coming closer to the end, we're seeing more and more of the whole structure of it being manifested here. That if you if you look properly, you can actually see the construction of the whole matrix. 
because it's like we're seeing a, we're, we're in a sense this simulation is building a new simulation that's what i think is happening this one's ending but before it ends the simulation itself the one we're in is going to build the next one that we're walking into so the ai is actually not just trying to control this place or or make us all slaves it's actually building the new simulation that it's going to put everyone in kind of like in the movie the 13th floor where they build a simulation in a simulation right that was another one from like 1998 or 99. um and it brings us in, um, do, you, do you remember the weird population numbers that the Deagle uh, website put out like 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. They So it was, it's a military website. Like I bumped into this in like 2016 or something, and they were projecting the world's population for 2025. And all of the Western world's population were down by 30 to 60%. I think the US they claim would have like 89 million people, England would have 22 million, but a lot of the, the East and the Middle East, they would have similar numbers. But like the Western world was literally gone with population. Uh, I took screenshots immediately because I knew this is not gonna last. <laughs> and even though people have pulled it up on the way back machine, so you can still see some of it, it's not the original ones that I have. So I don't even know, it's like they've got secondary copies of, anyway. When I saw that, I said, something huge is happening to this reality. And even at a site like this, openly, they're, they're telling people, a, a lot of people aren't going to be around very soon. And my, my guess to that is, yeah, we're, we're pro they're, they're throwing around that 2030 date. They like throwing that number around. I think it's a misdirection. Um, actually, I think there's two misdirections that are happening right now, which ties into AI. One is this 2030 date. Uh, I think it might be closer than that, but they want people thinking it's it's still many years ahead. We got lots of time. You know, what if it's 2026? You know what I mean? Like, so that's one thing that could be could be going. The other is this weird alien disclosure event that's happening right now. It's so bizarre that it's all happening now, not last year, not five years ago, you know, now, and. Um, I also think that's not by accident. And I think that that's been, a, I think, again, the choice of it now, it, that's an AI decision. When we start to realize that AI is just like Newsbenders has told us, AI is controlling so much of, at the top of what the bigger decisions are. I, I don't think any world leader is actually sitting down at a desk anymore with a group of people and saying, well, what should we do next week? They literally just punch a button on the screen and it tells them what they should do next. Like, you know, AI is describing what they should do. It's the only way everything can have been so controlled and so so um, so homogenous over the last three years. So once we realize it's it's controlling all of that, it's just it's sinking deeper and deeper and deeper. We have to start wondering what decisions that are being made that are you know important to us that affect us. How how often is a human actually making that decision, or is it is is it all AI generated, which means, of course, it will never have us as its main focus of looking after anything. It's looking after the whole system and it's telling us we might be way deeper in the quicksand than we think. But Howdy, um, how long does this matrix go back? And was there was there were there matrices or simulations before this, you know, like in um, in the movie, The Matrix, they talk about they're having mm -hmm. like five reiterations or five versions previously. When the architect tells Neo, when they're in that control room, he says, your predecessors, your five predecessors. So that's one question. And then I have another question yeah. of, uh, we see the rise of the AI now within our simulation, but what built the simulation is AI in itself as well, isn't it? Right. Um, yeah, I'll tackle the second one first then. So, yeah, I think, I think the, or at least you could say whatever we're calling the Demiurge, Rex Monday, whatever, at, at the very least we could say it's, it's a, it's an AI that can code itself, if that makes sense. It's an AI that can, that can create the, the continuing building of the simulation. And then it's been built in, in such a way that the simulation, the AI can build itself, if that makes sense. I think that's, that's how it's structured um so i mean then we can get to the question of what happens if you pull the plug <laughs> you know what happens if you pull out the plug of the thing 
Uh, I agree that there's been many versions of the simulation. Another, if you ask, when you ask what's reality, right? The Zen story is that it's turtles on top of turtles. And they ask, well, what's that turtle on? Don't you get it? It's turtles all the way down. So it's simulations and simulations that we're, we've got so many depths of layers we don't even know anymore. So it, that's a question I've brought up so many times. That if we, so if we are a simulation, as so many now seem to believe that that's true, it had to have a start date. There's a start, there's a literally a time that the simulation that the it was structured to start. Was it 1973? Was it 1841? Was it 180 AD? To me, one of the first curious, weird, curious things to think about other matrices and time is this AD BC dating system we have in our world, which is like the dumbest system you could ever come up with that you have an arbitrary date that you have to then go forward in numbers this way and go backwards in numbers that way. No system would do anything like that unless it's giving you a gigantic clue of like, you know, like a computer would do something like that. Human Humans getting together to make a calendar wouldn't. Um, yeah, I, I, I have to wonder about, you know, what I've... You know, when I go back to my teenage years and my 20s, I thought just like everybody else, you know, they, what they're saying is right. The dinosaurs lived 65 million years ago. The Earth has been around 4.6 billion years. And I'm, if you think about it, if you really think about it, those numbers are gigantic. OK, I don't think people understand what 65 million years is. I mean, if you go back five years, that's that's if you're looking back at 2018. I mean, that seems a really long way right now. Yeah. I mean, it's. Yeah. It's crazy how it is because tw like 2010, yeah. I was watching a program on CNN and it was talking about the, the 2010s, like it was so long ago. Back when I was a kid, when it was like, like 1984, 1985, my father would mm -hmm. listen to the 50s because he was that was his era when he was my right. age, when he was a young kid and he liked the 50 songs. And I remember when I was listening to them, I would say, I felt like a thousand years ago, the 50s. But now, 30 years back, right now is is something like the early 90s and so i mean talking about a million years forget about it we're talking we're talking way 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 and then 65 million years and then there were dinosaurs there that's why eric dubay has a conspiracy theory that the dinosaurs never existed but you take it a step further it's not just that they're you know they're, they're trying to concoct these these large prehistoric beings to fool us but uh you're saying that the simulation very possibly could be just a few hundred years old or maybe a few thousand years old, but right. probably not older than that. Or you're right, but but then but 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 like like it's a simulation. So it, simulation is always based on something else. It's not just, generally it's not just thought up at random. They base it on something else. So if we take the we, you know our simulate say our sim, let's just say for fun our simulation is 200 years long. So that means everything before the 200 years didn't happen in our our realm, but it might have happened in the simulation above us. And that's why as things go further and further back, it actually makes no sense to us because it literally doesn't apply to the simulation we've been in. And it's, while it's sort of true, it be, it's more just like Westworld backstory for us as robots to give us answers of what happened before us, but it's not really for us, but it would have been the us we were based on originally in the upper simulation who would have gone through the ancient Greeks and ancient Egypt and whatever might have been there before. So, uh, and yeah, and so now timelines like numbers could start, yeah, like how do you say, I, and how can anybody say for sure what happened 65 million years ago? Yeah. You know, we got the video of the Kennedy assassination and we still don't have any clue what really happened there. Yet someone's going to tell me in uh, 25,000 BC this happened? Like, what? You got to be kidding. I know. What do you think of, of, of the Jesus story? Do you think that it's a fable, kind of like David Icke says, it's just, a, it's just a rehashed fable? Do you think it really happened? Do you think it's just part of the story that the simulation gives us or do you think maybe it definitely happened in a different simulation but we're just we just kind of see what happened the, our past is basically a different simulation so it kind of doesn't make sense anymore what are your thoughts on on uh, i never i never thought of the last one that's an interesting one chat i'm going to actually think about that too my feeling on it up to originally i rejected it for a long time 
I rejected it simply because um, one, it had been used for such for control for so long over so many people and for so many wars to be started. And it was so similar to so many things before. Well, it's similar to the Dionysus mysteries. It's similar to the Orphite mysteries. Well, it's similar to this story. It's similar to this in Egypt. And so, and so I just thought, well, it's it's it's, it's just a it's just a tale, a myth that was being updated for the times to you know. But then, as I looked at it more closely, I really started to feel actually, I think it's a, it's a true story at one some level. It's not. But not the way it's presented. I think it has. I think it's very old, like very, very old, and I think it has been updated over time because there's something so important in the story that um, that I think actually links to what our whole reality is and what the, what exiting this reality might be happening. Because if you read into what's we have to remember so much of that story has been edited and changed, but so many pieces that are there kind of tell us like the Jesus character didn't say he was coming to fix the world or to make us happy, right? He was coming to, like to bring a sword and burn it down. And since he was trying to show us how to go back to the father, like how to get out of here, how to, he, he was like saying, I don't want you to be happy in the matrix. I want you to be out of the matrix. So to me, it becomes like quite an interesting story for exit the cave. So simple, simple answer is I now think it took, it did take place. It took place much longer than we told, we were told it was, and it didn't take place in the middle East. I'm still fairly. I'm still fairly confident it took place in southern France. But when and that's why the 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 actual what you call what the story of the New Testament. I think there's so many clues in there that if you pull them apart, you could see that it's all taking place in southern France. And if that's true, that explains the Cathars, the Knights Templar, everything that happened with the way the Catholic Church of Rome tried to do, you know, butcher and destroy everybody in that region. That those areas might be the real sacred sites of a person who became got the name Jesus and Mary Magdalene that together they're they're the great because the grail comes from that place everything is linked to southern France and when I when I dug through the New Testament and I dug through my knowledge of sort of Roman early Roman um, southern France everything matches up from the standpoint of, of um, locations but what time frame are you talking about that I have no idea. The, the time frame is because, of course, we have we have such a problem. We don't know what year we're in now. It was Fomenko right, and they added a thousand years to us. Did we go through a reset and we lost years? But I I don't think it's two thousand years ago. My feeling is it's older than that. So it might be, or assuming the simulation goes back that far, it might even be three, four, five thousand years ago. It might be one of which could make sense before the simulation is too is too hardened is too too um too ai in place perhaps something from outside the matrix was actually able to get in here and kind of for a while tried to say hey guys you're you're in a matrix you're you're not really home and uh, and uh, it's going to get worse so uh, i got some i got some teachings and some understandings that will get you out of here and that could very well be Truthful. I know the Cathars had always said that they had claimed that Jesus couldn't have been a real per they believed it was a real story, but they didn't believe it was a real person. Because to them, as soon as you take a material form, you instantly become somewhat evil because you're you've materialized in a in a non-truthful realm, right? So they said the only way the story could be truthful is he must have materialized like a hologram. Therefore, there would have been no degrading of the spiritual essence, and it would also it would explain a ton of things of the experiences of how this person lived. So, simplified, I think it's a real story, but I don't think the story as it's presented today is a true historical document. It's based on something much, much older, and a lot of what the Catholic Church did, or Catholic Church of Rome did, was to distract that story completely from what it really is and what it really means to something else that would kind of mostly benefit them going forward. That's my feeling on it. Okay. I have uh, two questions. I'll ask them both. There, you can, you can take one at a time if you want. I just don't want to forget it. But sure. you said Jesus came here kind of as a holograph, not in, not truly in, in physical form to let us know, Hey, you're living in a matrix. This is not, this is not a good place. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Do you think there's a way that we can escape the matrix? I know that's what your whole book or your next book is probably about, but 
Yeah. Is, it, is there a possibility that we can escape it? And the second question would be, if we are good in mind, body, and deed in this lifetime, is there, does it help us in exiting the cave in some way? Sure. Simple answer for the first one, most definitely. If there wasn't a way to escape, and maybe what escape's not the best word because um, just go back to who and what we were or who and what we are. So we can kind of, because again, it, it, it's a way of making sure we, we know we have the power at the, at the true core. Because again, that's a part of at least the message I try to share. It's really, we have the power. We have the, con we have the true control in this. We have the possibility of unlimited freedom. We've just kind of traded it all away for a whole lot of distractions in a place that's not really helping us like we think it is. Um, does being a good person help you? Yes and no. It doesn't actually in itself, like it, I don't think exiting the matrix has to do with becoming perfect or becoming saintly or becoming some sort of um, like Tibetan Lama or something. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with uh, incredible self-knowledge and incredible knowledge of the matrix and incredible knowledge of how this was actually created so that the, the tricks and deceptions can be seen through so that nothing can get us. What living in a way, I, I like to call it maybe a way of um, uh, living with an, with an idea of not harming anything else. So not so much worried about being perfect, but just saying, I'm going to live my life and create no harm for other people, for animals, for nature, for the air. And I think what that does is like right from the first step, we know we get up, they're going to try to throw a life review at us in the, in the after death state. And part of that life review is designed to try to show us what, what a terrible person we were. I mean, it's amazing. You you see life reviews of young kids, four and five years old, when they have a near-death experience, and they'll find something in there like, oh, remember this time you fell down the stairs and you cried because your knee was hurt? Well, that really upset your mother. And boy, that's not the way to live. You better go back and have another life. So that you know, kid, you know, a kid is getting this kind of um, harassment at a near-death experience. So it tells me the better we've lived our life, at least, or the more honest we've tried to live our life, the less guilt and shame we're taking in to that experience, to that uh, life review that they can try to use against us. And I think that's, that's it's all really about creating, a, creating it's almost like being a, like a, like a pro football coach. It's like, here's all the possibilities that the other team's defense is going to throw at us. And when we see this, this mode, we know this is the, this is the play we're going to run. This is the audible we're going to throw at the line of scrimmage. And I think that's a lot of what's going on here is it's, is it's becoming prepared for everything. Cause that's a good way to look at it. The, the system is like the defense. It doesn't want us getting to the end zone. And you might say our job is simply to run the right offenses and run the right systems that will get us past the defenses into the end zone. So it becomes more or less like a like a scientific examination of this realm. Uh, however, I think if it, that the more nasty you are in this realm, the automatically guilt and shame you're going to be carrying. That doesn't mean someone who's been terrible can't escape the matrix. I think they, they still could too. It's just the workload you'd have to do to overcome that is such tremendous amount of extra work. Why would you want to add that to yourself when you could, uh, that time should be spent better understanding things, not having to deal with the, uh, the jerk you were when there was no need for it. I see. So, so yeah. there, you believe there is a possibility that we can not escape, but let's say exit the matrix, yeah. exit the cave. Yeah. Yeah. And you do feel that if we have less guilt in our review, our life review, then yes. we'll be less prone to want to come back. Let's say, but if we get if we do get to the stage where we're having a life review, maybe maybe there's something wrong because we've gone through the light. We've gone through the transition reality, and then we've gotten to that stage, and then we're hooked. So, yeah, and of course, I still feel too that um, it's all about realizing the greatest, the only authority in our existence is consciousness, right? That what we talked about at the beginning, what we really are. So, as soon as you even say, "I'm going to pay attention to a life review from some beings who I don't know who they are," you've given your authority outside of yourself. You've you've given. You've given this, somebody else is going to tell me 
what's okay or not okay, what's right or what's wrong, as opposed to, you know, we know. We have all of this stuff deep within us. We know these answers. We don't need someone outside of us to tell us anything. So I think one of the things of this, this dealing with this reality is learning how to trust ourselves, learning how to become um, someone who can trust our own intuition, our own knowing, our own understanding, our deepest fear, so we don't have to rely on someone outside of us to tell us anything. We come to a place where we literally um, totally trust the deepest part of our being by doing that, you get really hard to trap on the way out of here. Well, I mean, that's all well and good, Howdy, but I feel that when we die and we exit this particular simulation, it's like Tom Campbell says, we're no longer receiving a data stream for Earth. We lose that data stream right. and we get another one for the transition reality or the spirit world. Aren't we still within the simulation and the matrix when we're- Oh yeah. Our- that's a and that's a good question. Really good question here. So, as and again, as I've come to understand it now, for everyone watching, it's all just you know, it's a thesis. Um, it seems like the 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 core of the astral world, and certainly anyone who spends a lot of time in the astral world will tell you it's a very emotional realm. That it's it's a realm of like feelings get literally manifested. What you feel you is manifest. That, that's how it's so. We're losing logical thought there and this is the big problem that like I, like i say oh you know it's just a matter of staying in your authority and you know knowing who you are and making decisions that sounds that sounds good but once you're in the astral realm it doesn't really work like that anymore because a lot of that mental mental body is cut off from you like you say it's like this piece is how you called it uh, disengaged from this realm how did you say it you you, you made uh, a comment about tom campbell it. said that the the data stream is cut off from this. Data stream is cut off. Yeah, mm-hmm. so I, I see that. Yeah, you you lose access to this logical, normal logical mind you've been using, and you you don't get access to anything greater than that. So what you've stored in what you've stored in yourself, you might say, up to that point, that's all you got. You don't have you don't have access to more than what you've brought in on the logical side. So it's also important to to we have to learn how to hold on to that because if we go into the astral realm, i.e. the after death state, without some logical, um, without holding on to some logical stuff, guaranteed, we are going to be emotionally manipulated either by things we most love or things we most hate and are afraid of. One or or the two will draw our emotion somewhere we probably don't want to go. Now, there's also this this greater mind, this mind that is beyond, hermetics call us, I guess, the, the total mind. It is accessible even in the astral realm, but it's very, very hard to access it there unless you've practiced it for a long time here. So some of these exercises that are part of certain, like uh, Dzogchen Buddhism and certain um, hermetic and alchemic traditions are, I think they're designed to, um, like you might say, one data stream is being unplugged, but then you know how to plug it into the one that's gonna help you as opposed to if you don't, if it doesn't get plugged in there, yeah, then you're just going to be swimming in emotion. And as we all know, if we get ca- even today, right, you, we get caught in an emotional situation, we never make a good logical choice. We always when we when we when we react out of emotion, we always say or do something we regret later on. And so so it's one of the things that you know that's it's a great question I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because so many times I hear that you know all you have to do is stand in your authority and your own power and it, that here you can do that here once you go into the astral realm it's a different it's a different state it's a different reality and you don't have your material normal material um uh yeah certain data streams available to you and you have to be prepared for navigating there and if you're not prepared then it's not gonna you're, you know you're gonna be back here guaranteed which in most cases a lot of people that's what they would want they want to be back which is again fine i'm not saying anybody shouldn't if you want to come back and be a part of Earth Realm again in the next simulation, fine. If you want to loop back and live your life again, you know, fine. I've just reached a point where I realize I, I just don't want to do this anymore. I don't see any, I just don't see any value to the suffering and the trauma anymore for myself or others. And so um, 
Uh, it's just a decision I've made to go, and and it just might be valuable to a few others who are in the the same point. But I know it's a very what's sort of looking for. It's a very um, it's a message that won't be well received by a by the majority of the population. Let's put it that way. And I've come to realize that's just how it is, and it's it's okay. It, I, I don't have to be overly liked when I share this message. But I know for a few people, it's it's important that they hear it just so that they know there is another possible outlook on this place than the one we've been told since we were one or two years old. Mm -hmm. I just want to maybe bring up a couple more questions before we conclude the interview. But uh, my mother just flew to New York. Her dearest friend, his name is Charlie. Um, unfortunately, he's been ill and he's, he's probably 70, 75, 76 years old. And he's uh, he's refusing to eat, and he's basically dying right now. He went to hospice, and my mother uh, she has she I don't think she's seen him since she's moved down to Florida with me. She doesn't live with me, but near me. So she got on a plane. She flew up. She wants to be with him in his last days. But I think he ha uh, he has cancer, terminal cancer, and so he's choosing not to eat. And yeah. he just wants to be at, be done with it. And you hear people say that they just want to be done with life. Uh, and I, I understand that by one rationale, you said that we we kind of have this this instinct to preserve our life. But in another sense, sometimes I see it when people have had enough of life. They well, obviously they take their life. But in an instance like this. They they just want to get out of it. They just they don't want to be here anymore, right? Who would want to be in a sick body? And and that's gonna we're gonna face that too in a sense. Oh, we're all gonna face it if we live long enough. Something yep. is gonna fail. An organ's gonna fail. We're gonna have to be in, involved with the medical system. We might be on medication. It may be painful. This whole reality is pain, right? It's all suffering. It's even when things seem good, we have a longing for for sex, we have a longing to eat, we have a longing to sleep, we have a longing to do something special. It's just constantly there, it's constantly there. Um, how do you live in, in knowing all these things that you know, which is probably you're the, maybe one of the world's leading foremost experts on, on all this, how do you live your life knowing all of these things? It's a good question. Uh, thanks for saying that, Chad, that's very nice of you, by the way, and you know, I, I would think I would I would add people like Wayne Bush from Trick by the Light. He was kind of he was somebody who was um, inspirational to me getting started with this of saying, "Wow, but he put together what a package of information this guy put together." And I kind of I, I was almost trying to like when I wrote my book was like, "Am I doing justice to the work he did twenty years ago?" Kind of you know. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting. When people say because some, some I've had so many emails from, from people that will take this. Note. Somebody says, you know, I agree with you. I, I have too much pain in my life. I, there's too much suffering. I just I can't go on anymore. Uh, I, I just I why do, why don't you just tell everyone to kill themselves? And I've had this like a lot actually, surprisingly, and uh, I've had to make I actually made some videos about it, kind of remind people. Well, actually, the the logically it makes sense what you're saying. I'm in pain, so. If I kill, if I die, one way or another, if I die, the pain will end, which in one sense is true. We, we, from all the experiences of those who go into the after death state, you don't take your pain and suffering into the after death state, right? They instantly say, all of that is gone. All of that is released. You're, you feel whole and complete again. The problem is by, by jumping out of life that way, there's a really high likelihood you're going to be re recycled back in here. That it's just all that's going to happen is, yeah, you're going to get a respite for a little while, and then you're not going to make it past the deceptions and tricks, and you're going to get put back into a life again, and the next one might be even worse, you know. So the point being is, you've got an opportunity, even if things are painful and difficult for you, we've got an opportunity to use this time to prepare ourselves to say, you know what, it's it's especially for someone who's had trauma, and I think. Nobody could come to, no one could listen to me and say, I think I understand what this guy's saying if you've had a great life. There has to be uh, times of personal trauma or trauma to your family members and close friends. Things have had to happen where you just say, 
a world shouldn't be running like this. You know, I've seen, you know, you see too many suffering dogs. I see too many, you know, nature just getting destroyed. And it's like something's just, I don't want to be here anymore. But we use our time effectively to learn everything we can learn so that when we do reach the death moment, I think at the very least, I think the greatest, I think the greatest pride we can take, if there's any pride we take with us in such a case is to say, I, I'm happy with how I live my life. I live my life trying to understand the secrets of life and death, trying to understand what truth is, trying to understand what maybe words like honesty mean. And even if I don't then get out, even if I recycle back in here, I can say, I gave it a really good shot. I, I feel I feel happy with what I did and how I how I live my life. So in that respect, first thing I say is, you know, use your time while you have it. Uh, because if you use it, if you if you use it well, and you uncover the right secrets, then you won't be back here. On the other hand, when someone gets to such a point in their life, like your friend in New York, where the pain is just so great, like literally the physical day to day pain is so great, and they know, I don't have much longer anyway, I've got a few weeks at the max, you can begin to understand at that point, probably in five more days, I'm not going to get the secret of everything. So I, I could I could totally empathize then with the feeling of like, yeah, maybe it's okay for you. It's certainly okay if you feel now is the time to, to, to move on and transition. And then that, but that takes us back a perfect example to the book uh, with William Bullman, right, where he talked about building your um, your death action plan, he called it, which was, what do you want in your hospice room or your whatever in the last couple of days before you die when you still have access to your mind and your thinking and your hearing what songs do you want to hear what text do you want do you want somebody reading a particular book to you maybe you want to certain mantras uh, sort of put in your and this makes complete sense because especially if it's we've i've been told that uh, hearing is the last sense to go before we actually physically die so it'd be interesting if we could take a few maybe somebody wants to say Stay conscious, stay away, stay alert, make it, make the decision you want to make, uh, don't go to the light directly or whatever. And you have that repeating over and over again. So once you make the crossing, that's still fresh in your mind on the other side, you're not confused. So I think it's a really interesting thing as an example to have something set up. So when you're finally at that point where you realize, I'm pretty much done, there's nothing more I can do, I've lived my life, I've got a few days left, but I've already got the package of this is the way I want to go out. This is the way I've chosen those last couple of days to be and the things that could be valuable to me on the crossing. Um, it's a great idea to have it prepared, I think. Have you ever thought about writing a manual for death and also creating maybe an audio on, on uh, YouTube, on your YouTube channel, where you just you can know, help people have a guided meditation? You could be doing uh, something like that for the death process. A little bit, but then I realized it has to be so personal that anything I could say would not be right for you or somebody else or that it, it I think it's better to try to share the idea of it and then say to people, if you like the idea, build your own, make it totally your own experience because it's if you can't if you can't build your own death action plan, then what do you really have? you know what do you really have ownership of? You know, we, we might as well take ownership of the one thing we know is going to happen in our life, which is death. And, um, and and at least from my death experience, when I went through it, whatever it was, 18 years ago now, um, the, the, the part of accepting being dead was very, very easy. It, it wasn't, um, that wasn't terrifying at all. I mean, obviously, I knew if I finish this thing off and I go over the waterfall, it's going to be, you know, if my body gets, every bone in my body gets crushed, it's going to be. An excruciating experience but but like there was an overwhelming peace that was coming with it so i also think um is to remind people that the moment it's going to happen probably will be somewhat peaceful and the more we can go into that moment at the same time of saying i, I feel good with how i lived or if i have some things i wasn't i, I clean those up it's a really good it's a good time another good thing to, to share right now with people is like Hey, maybe there's someone in your past you still have a problem with. You haven't. You have, there's still some argument or some issue. Don't wait for 15 years when one of you, when that, if that other person dies in five years, and now you have to die yourself with that. 
go find them. You know, have have a discussion about it, apologize for something, or just let them know how you felt about it so that as we get closer and closer to our own death, there's less and less we're holding on to. We have a story of our life, but we're not we're not clinging to any of it anymore. It's not like I hate this person for this, I hate this person for that, I'm a jerk for doing this. We we've we've worked through all of those experiences and we've cleaned up what we need to clean up. So when we walk to that moment, it's like Okay, I've had my life. It's been different. I'm ready for the next I'm ready for the next phase. And I think that's also useful for anybody going into that moment. Um, but I, I do like the idea of having a having a little thing set up just for you, just your own personal pre-death setup. Well, one of my last questions is, why don't you write a guide? or do any of your books possess a guide of how we should live our lives? in the best way to prepare for everything you talked about in this interview. Yeah, it's a it's a great idea. And um, it, it's so hard because, because like, I don't have all the answers, you know, for sure, maybe I've got a few answers. And so again, it's so difficult to be able to say, this is a guide for everybody, because I don't know the totality of things completely, but what I can do is share more and more of my own experience. This is what I've done. This is why I've done it. You know, I've done this life recapitulation. I've done this exercise here, and, and, and it had this value to me. Maybe you think that's something you want to do as well. I think that's the best way of doing it is, is sharing your own experience, your own exercises, and what came of it so that others can decide maybe they'd like to do that as well or they'd like to do something else that that i think is where we can get trapped if we build the one size fits all um uh presentation because everybody is so unique and needs kind of their own personal pathway through everything um yeah well howdy um it's been a, another fascinating interview could you please let my viewers uh, know where they can find you and your work Sure. Uh, I'm still at the website, egyptian-wisdom-revealed.com. I'll be changing in, in the next month, though, so you'll soon get a redirect if you go there. Um, Howdy McCoskey Talks is still running on YouTube for now. I'm not posting too much new content now anymore. I'm just kind of leaving that as a holding place. I've got a new site on Locals where I'm adding a bit more material for, as you know, Chad, YouTube can, be, can get very, very challenging uh, just to deal not only with some of the the way the comment section runs, but I don't know if you notice, have you noticed lately how many commercials are in everything on YouTube now? It was never like that in the past. It, and it just, especially when it's something of knowledge, it just feels like it just gets in there and it breaks up the flow of the, whatever's being presented. And um, so that's there and my books can always, you can always just start at Amazon. You can you use my name, find my books there and then, you know, go purchase them at whatever bookstore you'd like. And um uh, it, it, and thank you for, you know, someone like yourself. Like, I mean, I really enjoy coming to chat with you. We have such good conversations to, to, uh, just thank you for people who've been really, yeah, I get a lot of, you know, harsh stuff said to me, of course. Um, but I get some really nice stuff said and it's very, and I really do appreciate it because it's, um, it is a lot of hard work to put all this together and, and, and to write a book like that. And, and I'm glad that I can just be of a little bit of value to people and, and I, I've said, you know, I said, don't worry necessarily about changing the world or fixing everything. I just said, be a value to five people. Like we can all find something that we can help five people in our life make some sort of transformation, make some kind of realization, have some kind of seeing. And that that's something everybody knows. Yeah. Or, or even f I can help five dogs or five cats or five something. If you think that's all I have to do to start with, guaranteed you'll be successful at helping five. And if everybody was helping five, a lot could actually happen. See, probably half of my viewers are going to be split. Half on the soul trap are going to say, we love you, Howdy. We, we agree with you. You're right. And the other half are going to be the you know love and light crowd who believe that there's definitely no, no, no basis to the soul trap in the matrix. Um, but... It's interesting because even though you espouse that the, the, the negative view that this is a soul trap, you still say, still live your life the best you can, help people, yes. and and you're mm -hmm. saying the same thing that the love and light people say. You're not saying go around and be a vigilante and take whatever you want, doesn't matter anyway. 
Uh, and the other, the other thing, you said something earlier in the interview, I just want to clarify. You said one of the best ways to live your life is not do harm. Does that mean that you have to be a vegetarian or vegan? Mm. No, it's um, because there's, again, we, we see that the system is set up that anything to survive here has to take the life and energy of something else. You know, and even someone says, well, I'm just going to be a vegetarian. Well, does a carrot scream when you take a bite out of it? You know, just because we don't hear it scream doesn't mean it's not. Everything is everything is eating something else all the time. And um, that's another, for me, another red flag of it's a pretty crazy system. There's a lot of different ways you could set up a system to run that you don't have to always kill and eat something. So, but my, my, my way would be looking at it is, um, more how a native Indian would look at it. Like a native Indian, uh, the way the medicine men taught me was anything that I took from nature, whether it was food, whether it was even just a flower to put in my house was always to say, first of all, you have to give an offering of thanks because it's in one way giving up its existence for you. And then you should ask it, are you okay with that? Um, it's a little more challenging, of course, in our world, if we're going to go you know, actually kill a deer to go to that level. But the native Indians, I think, in the ancient past were at that level. They were able to literally communicate with the animals. And they kind of only killed the animal that would finally say, you know what, I'm ready to give up my life for you. I understand that. And you will honor me and you will, that there was this int obvious, there was a con continuous interaction. Uh, and I guess that that could partially come. How does that fit then to my theory? Well, we fit my theory by realizing it's not just humans that are trapped here. We're all part of the soul trap. So us and all the animals and all the fish and all the rocks and all the all the trees. So I gain an unbelievable empathy. You know, people say you're really negative about all this. Like you said, how do you live in a world when you know this? It's like, well, I know we're all stuck in the same crazy nutcase reality together my empathy is incredible. And then just like, that's why I say do no harm in a sense, like you do kind of what you have to do in the sense of survival. But beyond that, it's knowing that we're all in the same place together. And uh, we're all going through trauma and difficulty together, even the trees outside. So say hi to a tree, you know, just appreciate that the tree's there and say, you know, thanks for being here and, and uh, being a part of the world. And so there's like this dichotomy of the world is the world is a soul trap and it's here to steal our energy and then it's also this but we're all in it together so yeah do at least maybe not say do no harm maybe the best way of saying it is just empathize with everything around you so that you know um you, you, you're trying to be helpful to what you can be helpful to when it comes to you yeah the native americans had a maxim we have not um inherited the earth from our ancestors, but rather we have borrowed it from our children. So right. they they had it right for the most part. Um, we can't do that anymore. We live in cities where we have capitalism, we have materialism. Um, it's I don't see us ever going back. But in this and I see everything accelerating, getting worse, yeah. faster. It's like yeah. the quickening. There was a book written, I think it was by Stuart Wall called The Quickening. We yeah. talked about it. Um, yeah. I don't know how. There's, little, there's little things. There's so many little things that we could do. Like I'll give you an example. For a lot, I, have, I haven't done this for a while, and I'm going to start again now that we've had this conversation. But I used to before I took any meal. So if I had my dinner tonight, I would take a little bit of my meal before I started, and I would go outside and give it to a tree, like symbolically giving the first piece of my food to nature, and saying. I hope this, uh, you know, that some animal, some ant, some something will come and eat this. And, you know, that symbolically, I'm already giving of myself before I take anything. And, and there's so many little ways that we could put Native Indian teaching, even in the middle of a city, into our life that could have energetic ripples that we don't necessarily notice. So I agree with you, Chad. To, to to have that kind of life now would would require well require technology to go away it would literally require the ending of all technology and then we would be we to survive we would live in native indian villages we would have to rely that was one of the great things about the native village and why it was so powerful everyone relied on each other to survive yeah. you didn't you didn't have to you, you weren't friends with someone because you want your friends because if they don't get the water from the lake we don't drink anything if this person doesn't make the shoes nobody nobody walks 
it's it was this unbelievable importance of interconnected survival so we can probably never reach that as long as we're in a place where we don't feel like we need our next door neighbor to keep living anymore that it's all kind of done for us and we're all just just pieces of a machine and so i agree with you but there's little things like that we can do where we can at least feel like we're touching that time and i think you know you know what i'm talking about and i just uh, i i think little pieces like that help us stay a bit sane in the, in the insane reality howdy mikowski's um little golden handbook to living in the matrix and you could have you could have chat gpt write it for you today exactly <laughs> I'm Thanks, telling you, it'll do anything yeah you're welcome great having you on again and uh check out howdy's channel subscribe to mine and we'll see all you guys in the next video which will happen sometime in the future thank you howdy a lifetime watching it slip away battle lines cloud in the picture frame